All right. Looking at the Gospel of Mark, started on the text last week. And in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, he says, The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then he proceeds to identify that beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ with the ministry of John the Baptist and the events that are associated with that ministry, particularly the baptism of Jesus and his subsequent testing in the wilderness. And Mark explains that John's role in initiating Christ's ministry, it was in accordance with what was written in Isaiah the prophet. It wasn't something of recent origin. This was a long-standing part of of the plan. It's all part of the long unfolding story of God's work through the people of Israel to heal the consequences of sin that had invaded God's very good creation in the time of Adam and Eve. Jesus, Mark reports that Jesus is baptized by John, and this is the formal launch, if you will, of Jesus' kingdom-bringing ministry. And Mark says that Jesus, under the compulsion of the Spirit, he went into the wilderness for 40 days where he was tempted by Satan. And as I said last week, it seems the Spirit throws Jesus into the deep end of the pool to experience the the nature and intensity of the spiritual battle that's been joined to taste the wiles of the enemy in a state of deprivation and physical want and that experience will serve Jesus the God man it will serve him as he walks the road of crucifixion I want to pick back up in in chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, where he says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. Now as I noted last week, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, They don't report the time that Jesus' ministry overlapped with that of John the Baptist prior to John's arrest. The time really between Mark chapter 1 verse 13 and Mark chapter 1 verse 14. The synoptics, they move from Jesus' testing in the wilderness straight to his ministry in Galilee after John's arrest, presumably to emphasize the distinction between Jesus and John in terms of ushering in the new age, in terms of ushering in the kingdom of God. John was the last of the old age, the herald of the kingdom bringer. Now, as Wenham said in that quote from last week, they're part of the same cavalcade, but John is the part of the old age, and he's the herald of the kingdom bringer, and Jesus is the new dawn. And in Galilee, Jesus preaches the good news of God. He preaches this good news, this gospel of God, that the long-awaited kingdom of God was at hand. As I've said on many occasions in many classes that I've taught, the story of the Bible is the story of God's working through the people of Israel to rescue His creation which includes mankind, to rescue creation from its fallen state. People are the high point of God's creation, but His rescue effort includes all of creation because all of creation was damaged or harmed as a result of sin. That's why Paul in Romans chapter 8 Verses 19 to 22, he says that creation itself looks forward to the day when it will be freed from the consequences of human sin. All of creation has been damaged and involved in this. And God is rescuing creation from the consequences of sin that invaded it. Now the Old Testament... It ends on, this no, on a note of unfulfilled hope. It was clear, it's clear in the Old Testament, that in one sense God always had ruled the world 
from the time of creation. He was on the heavenly throne. You can see, for example, in Psalm 11, 4, and Isaiah 6, 1. And he reigned over all things. You see, for example, in 1 Chronicles 16, 31, Psalm 93, 1, and elsewhere. But there was some sense. There's some sense in which his kingly rule wasn't being fully expressed, fully asserted. He was allowing creation to go on out of step with his ultimate intention for creation. To continue in a state of sin and suffering and brokenness that was contrary to his ultimate purpose and vision. So he's sovereign, he's on the throne, he's over all things, but there is a sense in which he is not fully asserting that sovereignty to bring all things into conformity with his ultimate vision. He's allowing creation to go on with this sin and fragmentation. But the prophets in the Old Testament, they saw that a day was coming a day was coming in which God would express His rulership of creation in such a way that all things would be brought into harmony and conformity with His ultimate will and purpose. His creation would be rescued. It would be redeemed from the dreadful consequences of sin that had invaded it. You see, this world of rebellion, sin, hostility, brokenness, fragmentation would be rescued by God and would be transformed by Him into a true utopia, into a perfect reality of love and joy and fellowship with one another and with God. The prophet saw that vision of God's healing work and this full and ultimate expression of God's sovereignty and rule, which is revealed in the Old Testament, that is the state for which God's people have longed. And it's a state that goes back, particularly in the first century. You have people anticipating and expecting, based on the book of Daniel in chapter 9, thinking that the kingdom is coming. And you have a lot of speculation and wondering about that in Mark chapter 15, verse 43. Joseph of Arimathea is described as one who's waiting for the kingdom of God. And so God's people have lived in this expectation and this hope that God will intervene to heal the brokenness that has been part of this creation since sin invaded it. Robert Saucy, in his, in his chapter, The Eschatology of the Bible, in the Expositor's Bible Commentary, Saucy says, according to the Scriptures, there is a sense in which God has always ruled and is even now the king over all creation. But there's another thread of truth that views the kingdom as yet to come. It is this last theme that dominates the eschatological hope of Scripture, God is king over all his creative works, but his kingdom is not established on the earth in human history. While he rules over the affairs of the earth with nothing occurring apart from his permissive will, he has allowed sin and rebellion to enter history and Satan to have a certain dominance as the God of this age. God's rule might be said, therefore, to be over the earth, but not directly on the earth. It is the coming of God to establish this latter condition, to bring his kingdom to earth in the vindication of his sovereign holiness that has constituted the hope of God's people throughout all time. So you have people who are looking, they are expecting, they are hoping, long, long waiting for when is God going to intervene and heal this broken creation. When is he going to do that? And Jesus comes and Jesus was announcing God's definitive intervention in history. He comes into that social environment, into that religious world, into that place where people are wondering, uh, is it coming? 
We're expecting the kingdom. Is it going to be coming soon? You have all of these pretenders coming up and saying this. In that environment, Jesus comes in and he says, the time is at hand. The time is at hand. You see, the kingdom of God is at hand. He comes proclaiming the gospel of God. Now, the good news, the gospel of God, the good news was that the kingdom was at long last arriving in the person and ministry of Jesus. He is the kingdom bringer. So we've had humanity looking, longing, wanting forever this long, long time. Since creation began, you've had humanity looking for this, healing and here comes Jesus, the kingdom bringer. You see, in, in uh, David Wenham, in his book on the parables, he's an Oxford theologian, he says, to sum up, in proclaiming the kingdom of God, Jesus was announcing the coming of God's revolution and of God's new world. As promised in the Old Testament, God was at last intervening, Jesus declared, to establish His reign over everything, to bring salvation to His people and renewal and reconciliation to the world. This is a tremendous event. This is a momentous event. That's why when John launches this ministry, you have all of this going on. This is this, this intervention of God. That's why Jesus tells the disciples in Matthew 13, 17, For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see. They longed to see what you see and did not see it. They heard about it. They looked forward to it. They longed to see it, but they didn't see it. And many, and, and to hear what you hear, and didn't hear it. But you see it. You hear it. I am here. The kingdom is coming in me. I am the kingdom bringer. Now the Jews, their expectation, their eschatological view, I always say, I, I laugh, I, had, I used the word eschaton one time, oh, Daryl's, he, he's not here, but he asked me if I made that word up, I always got a kick out of that. Eschatology is the study of end, end things, and the Jewish view of eschatology, this is how they saw things. They expected the kingdom to come suddenly and decisively. They thought God's final intervention it was going to be a one-shot deal, the day of the Lord, where the old age would be terminated abruptly and the new glorious age, the longing of humanity, the healed creation, the kingdom of God would then come in. So we'd have the old age of brokenness and fallenness and sin and fragmentation and hostility. Boom! Then we would have the new age. Well, that would all be gone. And Jesus works in that, and he has to correct that. He has to correct that. You know, this caused people, when Jesus tells them, listen, for example, in Matthew 12, 28, the kingdom of God has come upon you. When Jesus says in Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is among you. Well, given this expectation of the Jews that when the kingdom comes, that will mean the end and the termination of all that is contrary to the eternal vision of God. So when the kingdom of God comes, there will no longer be sin and suffering and death and sorrow and hostility and brokenness and fragmentation. And yet, Jesus, we look around and look at what we see. You're telling us that you're bringing the kingdom. You're telling us that the kingdom has come, that the kingdom is among you. And we look around and what do we see? We see all the marks of the fallen, broken age still here. And so they, they have questions about that. How in the world can that be? 
You see, and that caused people to wonder how he can be ushering in the kingdom of God when all these hallmarks of the old age continue. And you remember how even John the Baptist began to question as he sat in Herod's jail whether Jesus was in fact the one who would bring the kingdom. Because he's sitting here saying, I'm still suffering injustice. Was I wrong? Are you the one to bring the kingdom? And it's because of their concept of how the kingdom would be coming. Well, Jesus explained to them. He explained to them in parables which we often misunderstand. He explains to them the nature of the kingdom in many parables and in other teachings that the kingdom comes in two stages. The kingdom is introduced or inaugurated. It is a present reality, but now it is not the sole reality. It is introduced, it is inaugurated, then there is an interval of time when it overlaps with the old age of Satan. That's where we live. We live in a time where the kingdom of God is a present reality, but not the sole reality. We live here in this overlap of ages. And Jesus tells them that. But then there's going to be this decisive intervention when the kingdom is consummated or finalized. When all that is contrary to God's eternal vision is stripped out and the kingdom of God is then the sole reality. That is at the second coming. That is the time when we have new heavens and new earth. That is the time when we'll have no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain. But in the interim, we live among these things. The kingdom that Jesus brings, he inaugurates it. He institutes and he tells these parables that says, this is something that's unobtrusive, not obvious. But what does it produce? Something tremendous. And this is what he's teaching us about the nature of the kingdom in the face of the incorrect assumptions of the Jewish people about how the kingdom would come. So when they say, how can you be telling us that you're bringing the kingdom, that the kingdom is among us, when we see all these hallmarks of fallenness, and he has to tell them and teach them, your understanding of the kingdom is off. And he teaches them this. And if you remember anything, remember that. This is fundamental New Testament theology. Okay? And he teaches them this in a lot of different ways. Now the exhortation... The exhortation to repent, we're getting ahead of ourselves with all of that, but uh, it'll serve us. Now, the exhortation to repent and believe in the gospel. I mean, this is years before Jesus is dead and raised from the dead. This is years before that. And yet he's telling them here, believe in the gospel. Now, what would we do? We have the gospel is death, burial, and resurrection. Well, he's not dead yet. What is he talking about? And what I'm, He's talking about this intervention. He's talking about the kingdom coming in his person and ministry. He is the kingdom bringer. You see, the, this exhortation to repent and believe in the gospel, it's a call for the people to turn from whatever alternate course they were on however they were arranging and orienting their lives whatever they were taking and believing is true it is to turn from whatever alternate course they were on and embrace the truth that he is the Christ he is the anointed one through whom God is doing his long awaited rescue work Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one through whom God is doing this. See, that was essential. That conviction was essential for receiving the blessings of that work. So the gospel of God, the good news of God that he mentions in, in verse 14 is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
the good news of Jesus Christ that he mentions in verse 1. The gospel of God is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is because he's the one who's bringing it. Now the content of that faith, the content of that faith in Jesus as the anointed one, as the agent of God's rescue of fallen creation, the content of that faith will expand as the specifics of Jesus' ministry unfold, ultimately encompassing his death, burial, and resurrection. But faith in Jesus as the kingdom bringer, faith in Jesus as the kingdom bringing Messiah, that's constant. The content will expand as we begin to see as his mission unfolds, well, what does it involve as the Messiah works God's will in rescuing? What does it involve? Well, it's going to involve his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. So that all becomes part of what we now look in the content of that faith. But here he's telling them believe in the gospel. Believe that the kingdom is being launched. What you've waited for for so long. All of the generations of people who have looked. And it's here. It's here now. In my life and in my ministry. He says in 1.16 one, in, in one to 20. From the shore of the Sea of Galilee. He calls these two pairs of fishermen brothers to follow him. Now Simon, who of course is better known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, and James and John, who are the sons of Zebedee. And Mark, he makes no mention of their prior history with Jesus as reported in the Gospel of John. He makes no mention of that. Now it's perhaps because this is after John the Baptist's execution, and when the call to journey permanently with Jesus was issued. You see, when this call to journey permanently with Jesus was issued, which Peter, with hindsight, he may have viewed that call as the pivotal stage of discipleship. And, and Mark draws this from Peter. So Peter may have looked at that call as that's when we really were called to journey permanently with him. That was it. Yes, we had contact with him, but that was really the definitive moment when we left and began to journey with him. Jesus tells Peter and Andrew, now which intention, it certainly applied also to the others, but he tells them that, that he would make them become fishers of men. In other words, he's going to make them more active agents in his work of rescuing people from sin and death by calling them into the kingdom of God. They now would be proclaimers of the gospel, proclaimers of the good news that, you know, this celebratory announcement of this great and beneficial work is what gospel means. So they are now joining him in being proclaimers of that gospel that in Jesus Christ, God is launching his kingdom. You see, this long-awaited work. So they are now proclaimers of that great news and that announcement. They've joined him in that calling them. They're proclaimers of it. And the four immediately leave. They leave their occupation. They leave their family. And they go follow Jesus. They're all following him. Now Peter, James, and John become what sometimes dubbed Jesus' inner circle of disciples. Now this is the James who would be executed by Herod in A.D. 44. So you see what this means, you know, like we think about, well, uh, you know, if I come, be, my life will get straightened out and I'll get a big house and this kind of stuff and I'll get a good job. Do you see what it means to follow Jesus? This guy says, listen, I'm a fisherman. I'm just sitting here living my life and what happened? He follows Jesus and where did it lead him? It led him to execution. He was killed, as you see in Acts chapter 12. John, of course, will later, later will write the Gospel of John, the Epistles of John, the book of Revelation. 
So this is who we have here. And then in 121 to 28, Peter and Andrew and Philip, they were originally from Bethsaida. And you can see that in John chapter 1 verse, 40, 1, verse 44. But it seems they lived in nearby Capernaum. These, these two towns are close together up here in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. It seems that as adults that they lived in nearby Capernaum. You can see it here in Mark and in places in Matthew. And James and John, they were partners with Peter. We see that in Luke chapter 5 verse 10. So they too may have lived in Capernaum. And that presumably, presumably is why they go into Capernaum where Jesus teaches in the synagogue on the Sabbath. You see here it says, and they went into Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. So here they are. These guys live there. They go in there and Jesus is teaching. Now as I explained in the class I did, well here you'll see up here, Bethsaida, Capernaum. Here's Galilee. Sea of Galilee. So, so much of the ministry where Jesus is now, that's where it's taking place. But as I explained in the, in the class I did on archaeology in the Bible, here he is, he's teaching in this synagogue in Capernaum, in that little town up there. Now, a large limestone synagogue was discovered in Capernaum, and it was thought to belong to the first century this white limestone synagogue there. But it was discovered in the early 1970s, it was determined that that white limestone structure, it really dates from the 4th and 5th centuries. So it's much too late to have anything to do with Jesus. But in 1975, excavators discovered black basalt walls under the four corners of this limestone synagogue. And further work revealed that those walls were four feet thick, which is much too thick to be a private dwelling. And the pottery that's associated with it demonstrates that the basalt structure that's under the limestone structure, that it was built in the first century. Now that's interesting because you recall in Luke chapter 7 verses 1 to 5 that a centurion was praised. So he's living then in the first century and he's praised for having built the synagogue in Capernaum. So we know that we have a first century synagogue built in the first century in Capernaum. And we have this black limestone structure that's not a dwelling that's under a fourth and fifth century limestone synagogue that dates from the first century. Now the underlying structure, it's the same size as the limestone synagogue, and it's laid out like that synagogue. And these reasons and the tendency to build religious sites on existing religious sites have convinced many that this basalt structure under this white limestone structure is in fact the first century synagogue in Capernaum where Jesus taught. In fact, the archaeologist uh, John McRae in his book Archaeology in the New Testament, he says that it, quote, is certainly the remains of the synagogue in which Jesus preached. Now, there are some others that aren't convinced yet that that is a synagogue under there. But there's a lot going for that claim. Now, the word immediately, by the way, let me say something about this. He says they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath he entered. The word immediately, <clears throat> rendered, it's rendered that way in the ESV and a number of other translations. It can carry a more general sense of just then or so then. And it's one of Mark's favorite terms. He uses this word 41 times in the gospel. Now, it's often, it's just a way of introducing the next reported event, okay? So you can get kind of caught up and thinking, he says immediately, immediately, immediately. It just, it's a more general word than that, okay? It's just a way of introducing the next reported event. And that's why some translations of 121 simply say, when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue. New Revised Standard, New English Translation. So, you'll see that sometimes immediately. I just wanted you to know that because it comes up uh, quite a bit. Verse 22, Mark 1, 22 says they were astonished 
They were astonished at how Jesus taught. They were astonished at how he taught, as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. See, his, his way of teaching floored them. That was something that floored them. The scribes apparently taught by citing previous teachers as authoritative voices. In other words, it, it looks like what they would do is they would build whatever they were claiming or arguing. They would go back to some prior teacher, accept that prior teacher's view as authoritative, and then take that as a peg for their argument and say, okay, he said this, he said this, so we take those things as true because these teachers are authoritative, and then they build that way. It's very similar to how a lawyer argues a case because a lawyer goes from th authority outside him right he goes and finds precedent where a court has ruled and established a principle or he goes to some kind of statute and he has authorities and from those things he constructs an argument that seems to be how these guys did it Jesus doesn't do it that way he doesn't go back and appeal to some earlier teacher as an authoritative he presents his teaching based on his inherent authority as the fulfiller of all things. And they noticed the difference. They said, this guy's not dependent on some other external authority. He's just saying it. He's saying it. Now, people sometimes say, well, well that's how we should be. Well, I, I'm not Jesus. You see, so he's, he's able to teach that way because he has the inherent authority. And so mere mortals, people like, like you, me, we sit here and say, okay, we're trying to figure this out and, and doing this. But they recognized there was something distinctive about Jesus, see. He's, he speaks with this transcendent authority as the Messiah, as the fulfiller of the Old Testament. Now, there's a man in the synagogue who's possessed by a demon, and here it's called an unclean or defiling spirit, and the demon, through the man, cries out, and what he literally says is, what to us and to you? That's what he literally says, what to us and to you? Well, that's an idiom, okay? It was Semitic in origin, but it made its way into colloquial Greek, and it's an idiom that means something like, what business do you have with us? What business do you have with us? Or even more colloquially, leave us alone. And that's how the New English translation, the New King James Version, render it. Now when the demon asks, have you come to destroy us? The us probably refers to his fellow demons. You see, this demon feels both hostility and fear in the presence of Jesus. Hostility and fear. Now, I want to do a little side note here on demon possession. Let me say just a bit about that. Compared to the rest of the Bible and to modern Western society, demon possession... Demons took possession of people with astonishing frequency during Jesus' ministry. Now, many in churches of Christ insist that the Bible eliminates any possibility of demon possession today. So, any alleged cases of demon possession necessarily are fraudulent or mental illness that's mistaken for demon possession but I'm not convinced the Bible reveals definitively that all demon possession has ceased. In other words, I'm not willing to say it's impossible from a biblical standpoint for demons to possess people today. We know from the book of Acts that demons continued possessing people for decades after Jesus' ascension. You see in Acts 5 and 8 and 16 and 19. And in the end, demons will empower people to perform fantastic miracles that will deceive people. In Matthew 24, 24, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10, 
Revelation chapter 13, 16, 19. Now, if demon possession is indeed a current possibility, in other words, if the Bible doesn't definitively rule that out, which I'm, con I'm not convinced it does. I think it doesn't. Okay, but I understand that there are people who think it does. But if, if demon possession is indeed a current possibility, there may be other explanations for why it's so rare in Western culture today compared to the New Testament. Now, Dwayne Garrett, in his book, uh, he offers several possibilities in his book, Angels and the New Spirituality. In other words, you say, well, wait, if demons can possibly be possessing people, then wh what is the explanation for why it seems so rare or non-existent today versus what I see in, in the New Testament? Well, here are some possibilities. Uh, Garrett says, first, demon activity may have been more common when Jesus was on earth because of the spiritual conflict surrounding the incar... That uh, should be one word, incarnation. The incarnation. All right. Second, perhaps demon possession is still common, but we don't recognize it as easily as Jesus did. Third, Jesus happened to come during a time that was politically, socially, and religiously unstable when people embraced strange new types of spirituality. Thus, demon possession was more common. On the third view, demonic activity waxes and wanes in different times and different places in proportion to the behavior of the society. Personally, Garrett says, I think there's truth in all three explanations. And I would say that part of that waxing and waning of demonic activity, if there's something to that, part of that would depend on what Satan thinks is the most effective strategy in a particular time and culture. He may be convinced, for example, he may be convinced that he can do more damage in a post-enlightenment Western society that tends to deny there is any spiritual dimension. You see, that's how we are. We think that's just superstition. That's just, pfft, that's just crazy. In fact, some of you may not even like me talking about demons. You see, so, so it may be that he recognizes that the better way to bag post-enlightenment Western society is to take a low profile to reinforce their belief that there is no spiritual reality. So, what's the game plan, Wormwood? Shh. Just back off. Okay, I mean, that, that doesn't seem all that odd to me. Then I see other cultures that I see report more of this kind of activity. And of course, if you're convinced the Bible says it can't happen, ah, that's just all nonsense. Those people are just crazy. Okay? But it may be this waxing and waning here. He may have something like that. But whatever the overall level of, of demon activity, I don't believe a Christian who's faithfully abiding in Christ can be demon-possessed in the sense of being indwelt by a demon. I don't believe that can occur. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 verse 9 that the Christian is controlled by the indwelling Spirit of God. Our body, he says in 1 Corinthians 6 19, is the temple of the Holy Spirit and there's simply no agreement between the temple of God and idols in 2 Corinthians 6 16. Now, there are no examples in Scripture of faithful Christians being indwelt by demons nor are Christians instructed to have demons cast out of them. Indeed, James instructs the saints in James chapter 4, verse 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Paul commands Christians in Ephesians 4, 7, do not give an opportunity to the devil. And in 6, chapter 6, verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So I do not live in, in fear or anxiety of being possessed by a demon. Now that's not to say that Christians are immune to demonic influences. How could we think that? Satan and his minions are always scheming 
to draw saint and sinner alike into evil and away from God's purpose. Paul speaks of these schemes in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. And he says in 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, that he feared the tempter might have tempted the Thessalonians so that the efforts of him and his companions might have been useless. He indicates in Acts chapter 5, verse 3, that it was Satan who filled Ananias' heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. You see, the issue is the nature and degree of demonic influence to which faithful Christians may be subject. And I, what I'm submitting to you is that they, they can't be subject to the nature and degree of demonic influence that is associated with possession. Okay? Can you be influenced? They're at work. How do they work? A lot of these things, I don't know. But they have their ways. And they are at work and they are opposed to the purpose of God. So I believe we're subject to the tempting and all this stuff. I do not believe we can be possessed. Okay? I don't believe we can be possessed. All right, in verse 24, the demon shouts, I know who you are. The Holy One of God. And Jesus rebukes him, commands him to be silent, and tells him to come out of the person. And this is the first example of what is known as the messianic secret in Mark's gospel. At various times in the gospel of Mark, you may know, but we'll certainly see, various times in the gospel, Jesus commands demons. He commands people he has healed. And he commands disciples to keep quiet about his identity or works that would reveal that identity. And in the case of demons... As here, I think the rationale is suggested by Mark Strauss. He says his purpose for the command is likely twofold when telling demons to be silent. It's likely twofold. First, to demonstrate his supreme authority over Satan's forces. Second, because the demons are inappropriate heralds of his person and mission, Jesus will reveal his identity in his own time and through his own words and deeds. Now, so that explains to me when he tells the demons, you're not going to be the herald. You're not going to be saying anything. And then the most plausible explanation for his commanding silence from those who have been healed and from the disciples is that he's orchestrating the timing of the revelation of his identity in fulfillment of the divine plan. I mean, even when his demand for secrecy was seemingly ignored, because you know there are cases where that happens. He tells somebody, don't say anything to anybody, and whoop, they're off. Second bell. Next week, Lord willing. Thank you. 